So you were just saying you were teaching a writing workshop on revision? Yeah, 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 at Cambridge Center. And so the it's an intermediate workshop for poetry, and the, the primary focus is revision. So all the exercises that we do are sort of geared toward how, you know, how do you, oh, sort of addressing that question, like how do you get back to that initial initiating spark? Or like how do you yeah. sort of re-see the poem, give yourself a chance to get into the poem again um, without sort of be, holding an allegiance like an emotional or even a like a um technical allegiance to the first draft or second draft or whatever draft you're on right. um and because that like we get an idea about what the poem is supposed to be about and it's really really difficult to sort of like go of that or even if we're trying to let go just sort of see our way through it and, and find a way to the other side and so uh, the exercises, like the writing exercises, even the stuff we do in class, the readings that I, I provide for them are meant to sort of just break that, just tear down the walls for them and just give them permission to sort of start all over again, even if that's not where they end up. Like when the for very first exercise that we did on the first day was like we read a poem together and talked about it a little bit briefly, but then I gave them a line from the middle of the poem. So, okay, that's now the first line. Gave him a title from another poem. It's like, now nah, that's the title to this poem. It's like, rewrite this poem. Like, start all over. Get in. What what can you do with it? And so we we do exercises like that. Not, if you did that with your own poem, like if you took with your favorite line from your own poem, made that the first line. And one of the reasons why I started doing this is because I, I believe it's Philip Larkin. I don't want to misquote people, but like the, the first the first line you write in a draft of a poem that actually excites you is really the first line of the poem and then just go from there. And it's like, well, okay, I'm going to use that as a, as an exercise. Um, and it gets great results. You know, even if that isn't the draft where you end up, even if the, the poem you write from that experience isn't the final draft, it'll help you get past seeing the poem in a specific way. And so now you have this other frame of reference and maybe something in, in between those two things becomes the final draft. And I've actually already seen some really, really amazing revisions of some poems because I, I, I emailed them before class and it's like, and I've taught, I've taught a version of this class before at Cambridge Center, you know, several years ago, um, you know, told them send, send up a, one of those poems you just can't seem to finish. Mm -hmm. um, and I've already, they've already, several of them already submitted revised versions of that poem and they're just so much different and, um, you know, I want to say so much better, but um, in, 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 cause it's, it's like a sort of a valuative thing to say, but they, they got to a new place and the poems just feel more successful. And there was one student um, who actually in, in, engaging with one of the, the reading exercises that I assigned, got to the place already before um, we started talking about what her poem really ought to be doing. And um, her revision was, was fantastic. Like it just, it was night and day. Yeah, it was really good. That's amazing. So you take, you have them take one line from mm -hmm. a poem that they're struggling with mm -hmm. and whichever line jumps out of them. And that's the beginning of the new revision. Yeah, like just write a new poem. Yeah, yeah, and and when when we're not zooming, like when we can actually <laughs> be in a classroom, uh, sometimes I do a variation of that where I have them pass the poem to their neighbor, and the neighbor chooses their favorite line, and then that becomes their launching off point. That's Which, really yeah, cool. That yeah. First line. <laughs> so well, because I think this is a really useful skill for writers when they're submitting their work too, mm -hmm. is to learn how to detach from mm -hmm. the work a little bit. When you're in it, you want to be fully invested, right? And you want to yeah. be pouring all your emotions, all your heart into it. But mm -hmm. then when you're at the point that you're submitting and you're starting mm -hmm. to see your own work from the perspective of an editor a little bit, mm -hmm. you need that cool, detached eye. Yeah, so yeah. that sounds like a really useful exercise for getting them yeah. to patch a little bit from their work. Yeah, and one of the things I'm actually gonna do for them, you know, some, some, some instructors, teachers, professors, like really don't like to do this, but I'm gonna share with them, I've already mentioned this, so I'm gonna say it here live as well. I'm gonna share with them a poem from my, Current manu the current manuscript that I'm sort of uh, shopping around right now, um, where the the very first poem that I wrote for that manuscript, um, and then the final draft of that poem from that manuscript, and not a single line survived 
to the final draft. It's clearly the same poem, but yeah. it, and there's some words that are the same, but not a single line from the original draft survived into the final draft. And it's like framed differently. And I, I literally mean framed because I, all the frames are in boxes that move across the page. Um, we can talk more about that manuscript. <laughs> right. um, and yeah. how long did it take from the time you wrote the first version of that to the time that it was its final version? Ah, uh, gosh, three years. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it, the, the book took a long time to figure out what it was supposed to do. And I guess I can, I can talk about it more. Um, so the launching off for the, for the manuscript is the movie Blade Runner. Huh. Yeah, and so I was like, I, I wanted to do this. I wanted to, I, but I didn't want it to just be Blade Runner. Like, because the movie itself um, obviously is an adaptation of Philip K. Dick's book, Through right. Andrew's Room of Electric Sheep. But his, his ad, if you've ever read the book, you know that his, his adaptation is, is essentially, it's a new form. It's a new artwork. Like, it, it's very loosely related to the, to the initial text. And so I wanted to do something like, I wanted to take what Scott did and sort of reinvent the way that he presented the text because it's so it's so imbued with so many other literary references, and so some of the things that I found out in in my research while doing this project just kept opening the doors to what needed to be um, expressed, and so you know I sort of knew that initially anyway, but then. As, as these new avenues and these, these literary texts presented themselves to me and, and like had to confront how do, I, how do I represent them in conjunction with this other primary text, the movie, um, and what's the best, most creative way to do this. And so um, the, the poems move in landscape across the page for one, and, like, and they're literally in frames like as if they're frames in a film. Movie stills, yeah. Yeah, um, but then they're also um, like essentially semiotic frames, huh. right? Where sort of framing the text and engaging in that conversation about uh, literary frames and what what is defined in within the frame and outside of the frame. And, um, but it led me in all these different paths. Like I realized there's moments in the movie that completely unexplained, and mm -hmm. this is kind of one of the reasons why I love this movie so much. Like Scott spends zero time and, and I've watched numerous interviews about the about the film and he spends, spends zero time talking about all the things that he incorporated into this other than sort of the technical components of it um but like there's references to the tale of the heike and actually in my in my research so there's this there's that I don't know if you've seen the movie no Oh, oh, yeah. the, the movie Blade Runner, yes, I've seen yeah. that. But I don't, okay. I'm not familiar with the tale of the Heike. I don't know. Oh, okay, okay. It's, uh, well, it's one of the primary, like, you know, the like in Greek culture, there's the Iliad and the Odyssey. Right. For, for Japanese culture, and this is like 11th, 11th century, there's the tale of the Genji and the tale of the Heike. Yes. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, and the tale of Heike is about the epic battle between the clans, the Heike and the Genji, and how the Heike end up losing it. And the Genji clan becomes the ruling clan of Japan and still for all intents and purposes really is. Um, and, but there's this, there's this, roof, there's this billboard in the movie where this woman is like, cause one of the, one of the unsaid things is like, it's sort of out of control of population and how do you control population? But there's this billboard, this moving billboard of a woman eating a birth control pill. It's never explained that that's what it is, but that's what it is. Um, but there's this haunting voice. Yeah. That, during that moment, but then I spent more time with the film. I was like, oh, it's everywhere. It's in, it's all the way throughout this. So I was like, what is that? <laughs> so I looked it up and it was really difficult to find, but it is quite literally that refrain that I kept hearing is quite literally the very first line of book 11 of the tale of the Heike. Like, <laughs> it's, it used, it's an oral form of poetry that got transcribed into right. language and but it usually the whole thing is performed by a solo performer performer um and i forget the name of the instrument but on a, a very traditional japanese string instrument like and so it's usually committed to memory by one performer and they do the whole thing so I like i found this performance this live performance and sure enough there was that refrain at the beginning of, of book 11 when book 11 is about this battle the sort of the turning point in the war where um there was a, there was a, like a, a lull in the fighting and the heike 
who who whose ships were off the shore um, in the water, like they sent this woman out with a fan attached to a pole, and they dared the emperor, the 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 general of the Genji army, to shoot it down. He's like, no, you know, obviously you just want me to expose myself, and as soon as I do, you'll you'll attack. And so he's like, he sends out his best archer, and. Um, this is like the sort of the rise of the samurai culture, right? And so his, his best archer is a samurai and he wades out into the water and he takes aim, you know, the, the, the boat is like bouncing up and down on the, on the waves and he takes aim and he shoots it, you know, it's like 300 feet away and he shoots it off the, he shoots the fan off the pole on the first try. And everybody's like so shocked. They start like celebrating both sides. And then of course the, the Genji use this as a moment to like attack. And this is sort of the turning point in the war, but like. So that archer, that's Deckard, huh? Right? Because yeah. he's a samurai. He, he's doing the bidding of because that's what the, the samurai code is. Like you, because that's one of the complications of the movie. Like is Harrison right. Ford a replicant or is he not? And then right. there's the unicorn at the end that in, indicates that he probably is. Because how would they know about his dreams if if they weren't? But anyway, um, right. So the samurai code is like you 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 do the work to you belong to who pays your way. Right. You don't have a choice in what you do. You just do what the person who pays your way wants you to do, which is what Deckard's case is, right? He Bryant is paying for him to do this, and there's a score to settle anyway. Um, so this sort of becomes the focal point of the book, and yeah, so there's a lot to explore. There's a lot yeah. of other references, clearly like Frankenstein and Adam and Eve, and right. yeah. So my research took me in all these different areas. It, it was a it was a long process, but it was a, it was a labor of love. <laughs> Well, this is a good segue um, because yeah. just um, to double back a little bit, I'm here with Ralph Pennell, editor of Midway Journal, um, and I'm Becky, and I write the um, Lit Mag News Roundup biweekly. Um, so welcome to everyone who's coming out, and if you have any questions uh, for Ralph about the journal, just type them into the chat and I will work them into the conversation. Um, and this is a great segue because I know that Midway publish or you say in the about page of Midway is looking for sort of cross genre work. Um, what is it work that um, complicates and questions the boundaries of genre, binary and perspective. So obviously that is something you're deeply interested in your own work. Yeah. Um, and so can you talk more about that in terms of what you're looking for? Yeah. Um, are yeah. you looking for people for writing that, you know, includes allusions and references and um, all that sort of thing? The short answer is yes, um, and um, and the short answer is also no. And and I'll I'll talk to like how I'll, I'll talk a little bit about sort of the, the I don't want to like leap ahead in in your in your series of questions here, but to talk about that succinctly, I think we I also have to talk a little bit about why the journal even came into existence and what our original goals were. Because uh, I'm one of the founding uh, founding editors as well. Um, the other three founding editors have, have sort of moved on and, and done other things. Uh, but we all we were all graduates of the Hamlin University MFA program. Um, we weren't all in the same cohort. Only two of us were in the same cohort. But um, we when we we all worked on Waterstone together. If you're yes. Familiar with Waterstone? Mm -hmm. Fantastic literary journal out of Hamlin. Um, and we were all got the opportunity to to work as editors on that. And so we wanted to do something similar after we finished the program and we weren't sure what that meant and we started talking and we 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 wanted to do and this is one of the reasons why we're online it's because you know 2006 is it was a different world and there were only a handful of literary journals that were online in fact there was still that great divide between print and online, and I still remember, you know, like there, if you printed poems in an online journal, you had to list it separately <laughs> from your real publications in your book in the acknowledgement section. So, like, you'd your acknowledgement section, then the um, online publication. Right? Wow. Um, and so we wanted to we wanted to be on the forefront of 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 that evolution. We wanted to be we wanted to, to narrow the gap between. Um, so that in, in, in eliminate some of the uh, privilege that print seemed to have over online publication. Um, and so 2006, we decided let's just be online. Uh, let's just be an online entity. We'll always be online. That's our, that's our objective. Um, and it's like, we have no idea what that means at this point. Um, mm -hmm. But we knew based on our own aesthetics, 
as writers that we wanted a journal that represented something between the avant-garde and traditional because we really weren't we didn't identify as avant-garde writers we didn't we didn't identify as traditional writers, but we all did work that inhabited that middle space mm -hmm. and we knew from our own sort of frustrations with sending work out that there wasn't a singular journal that that was created for those specific voices all the time in every issue mm -hmm. you know you'll find those voices sometimes in the traditional journals you'll find those voices sometimes in the avant-garde um, but never, and, and since then, there's definitely more that sort of work that way. But at the time, it was a very, very, very limited number. So we wanted, and that's kind of where the name comes from, mm -hmm. right? So we were literally living in the Midway, uh, be, which is an area of St. Paul. And so if you've ever been in the Twin Cities, you know the Midway. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, so it's like where Minneapolis and St. Paul meet, it's called the Midway. Um, but it's also where the state fairgrounds are, which explains our logo, right? Ah, the fair okay. logo, right? Yeah. Um, we had great uh, graphic designer work on that for us. Uh, her name is Mar Mari Richards. Um, she, yeah, she did a wonderful, wonderful job for us. Um, and then, but it also, spoke to our aesthetic, right? We're, we're, so we positioned ourselves aesthetically midway between these two poles. Mm -hmm. um, but it literally also, Minnesota's like midway between New York and California, which represent two different schools, right? There isn't necessarily a school in the Midwest. I don't, I don't know, maybe there is, but like the West Side voice is very different than the East Side voice. Mm -hmm. um, and so to, just to get a little bit more mileage out of the title, we decided let's just publish in the middle of the month instead of on the first. So we always publish, you know, we, we publish yeah. four issues and we always publish on the, the 15th. So January 15th, April 15th, July 15th. So just start to get a little bit more mileage out of the name. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, so this is, this is what we were looking for initially. We wanted work that, um, you know, question traditional genre boundaries. Uh -huh. uh, we even toyed around with the idea of not even asking for genre work like let's, mm. let's just not say we want poetry fiction nonfiction. let's just say we want work yeah. um but then you know we we caved because <laughs> we're like we've, what if we don't get any submissions right we need some people need signs they need posts yeah. um so we get we did that but then we also were working simultaneously with the notion that really they were just sort of arbitrary markers for us. And we we have published numerous authors over the course of the last 15 years where they sent us initially something that they they titled poetry. And we would talk with each other. I was like, you know what? I don't know if this, we want to publish this as poetry, but this is, this would make really interesting fiction. Hmm. Let's ask the author. It's like, I don't care if it's based on a true event. Mm -hmm. Let's ask the author if they'll be willing to publish it as po uh, fiction. And every single time we approach it, because, you know, it's a publication, right? um they would say yes so there and i'm not going to tell you which pieces right because <laughs> um, that sort of that's the site that ruins the the whole objective right so right. there's there's countless countless pieces published in midway that were sent to us as a different genre and so it's been that's one of the so great joys yeah <laughs> so would it would it be like a prose <clears throat> poem um no it, so it was it, it was in it was in it was presented as a like a poem on the page with the short yeah. lines that went about halfway across the page. And it's like, no, that that works as fiction. Let's do it. Interesting. And then did you work with them to change the formatting or you would just <clears throat> Oh no, not the formatting. Right. We we would make maybe like minor changes to the language. Right. Um, but like if who's some poems have more narrative elements to them. Right. Yeah, and so if the language feels more prosy and isn't mm -hmm. quite working as a poem, but makes a great story like why yeah. not and then sort of question let our readers figure out the sort of the format on their own like right. does it qualify <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting i've never heard that um being done like and yeah it sort of makes you think that these distinctions are somewhat arbitrary in some yeah yeah, right? yeah. So do you distinguish when you actually publish the work yes we 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 on we we don't we don't clarify how it was sent to us but there are genre specific okay. sections on the journal yes yeah, so right. fiction fiction and then we have ephemera which is everything um <laughs> and I'll, I'll circle back to that in a second um it's so just a, like another thing that sort of rose out of that because we decided again very early on like we're just we're gonna 
we're going to keep the boundaries loose. We're going to, um, we realized, and we, so one of the ironies of the journal is even though we, we were fully online and have always been fully online, we won't ever become like a, a print iteration of what we do unless we do, we, we might, every once in a while we talk about like doing a print best of. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard to like give into that because that's not online. I guess we could do an online version anyway. Um, so we used to get paper submissions when we first started because right. we were worried people, again, because it was so new in 2006, like people didn't trust Submittable yet, which was still called Submission Mash in the, <laughs> at that time. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. Um, and they were brand new. Um, and so there was like this, there's this whole so mythos um, that we were trying to undo. So we were like, let's, let's give people like a chance to sort of get used to the notion of a fully online journal, we'll let them submit USPS. And we got great submissions um, and we got the strangest bios. Huh. I, I don't know why. Um, that isn't as true anymore. And I, I think I blame Submittable, not because Submittable um, is like some sort of bastion of evil or anything, but I think it does homogenize mm -hmm. stuff a little bit with regard to how people approach submitting their work. Cause now you can submit everywhere mm -hmm. all at the same time. Like even back then, back in 2006, people were like, there was, you didn't do some simultaneous submissions or if you did, you didn't tell people, right? Mm -hmm. Cause, but submittable changed that like online submission formats change that now you're crazy. If you don't allow sub right. simultaneous submissions, people won't submit to you. Um, and unless submittable, you're, it, it saves your account information. So you like, I just use the same cover letter for. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we stopped kind of getting those crazy strange, right. really fun cover letters. So they were so fun. <laughs> we're like, let's publish the cover letters. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we approached the authors and like, can we, can we, we, you can count this as a publication with us. Can we publish your bio? And so we called it bio genre and published a, a section of, of bios. I'm like, yeah, it's like, you know, what, what is literature and what is, what is, what's a text and right. yeah. Can you ask for that again in Submittable? Is there a I way so. to like, yeah, I kind of want to, yeah. 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 I, it, it, it it's different to ask for it than to receive it sort of right. yeah uh, um um organically um but you know now that i've said it maybe it'll spread <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny i i think it was the editor i just interviewed tim green of rattle mm -hmm. and i think yeah yeah was, i watched that yeah, he, was good i interview. think he was saying the same thing that sometimes we <laughs> publish the contributor bios because there's something and this goes back to what you're saying about revision too like mm -hmm. there's something mm -hmm with the pressure off when you're writing mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. contributor mm -hmm. letter, because you're not trying to publish that, you know, you're not trying to publish that. Yeah. So you feel freer in some way. Yeah. 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 Um, that's a good prompt. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> write a bio, write, you know, weird bio that you know, you're never going to publish and then actually. No, it's funny writing. that you say that because I actually did a workshop with Michael Martone. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he has, um, this great book, I don't know if you're familiar with it, called Michael Martone. Okay. Where every single piece in the book is a fake contributor's note. And it, they all start out the exact same way. Michael Martone was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, blah, 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 blah. And then goes on and does this thing. But in the workshop, he, so the, all the, all the teachers, it was uh, Michael Martone and Robin Hemley. I forget who the poet was. Um, this is this was through Hamlin back in two thousand eight or okay. um, And so all the teachers got up and did a reading at the end, and Michael Martone was reading some of the contributors' notes that didn't make the book. <laughs> um, and he <laughs> said, "Yeah, he got commissioned, but I don't know if this is true. Um, but I want it to be true." Um, he said he got commissioned by a hustler to write some erotic. Okay. Uh, flash fiction. <laughs> um, so he wrote some erotic flash fiction, um, and he, he he went the wrong way. Like it, yeah. it it was no longer erotic, and like so they rejected them. <laughs> but he read these pieces um, in at the at the reading, and it was like I asked him for them, but he, he wouldn't give them to me. Um, <laughs> but like so, this whole idea is like, well, you know what's a bio like how right. far yeah and so what's acceptable and what 
what what is publishable and what yeah so it, yeah it's kind of also a, yeah well that's funny that he was commissioned to write an erotic piece that it ended up going in a totally different direction yeah, so this idea yeah. like when you set out to write something and mm -hmm, it ends mm -hmm. up being you set out to mm -hmm. write something funny it's going to mm -hmm, be serious mm -hmm. and vice versa um yeah and maybe yeah. there's something to the quality of writing your cover letter where it's just very yeah, yeah. uh but i think as an assignment i think i'm gonna have to yeah. I think you're right i think it has to be an assignment eventually somewhere yeah yeah, yeah. that's great maybe you'll get some good pieces for the magazine <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um so also in the magazine, you talk about uh, a sense of place being very yes. important. Is yeah. that something that you want to see in every submission? Um, I think, so one of the things, and th th this has a lot to do with our, our aesthetic at the, the, the language level as much mm -hmm. as sort of that situational level. Because um, the Minnesota State Fair is, <laughs> the Minnesotans call it the Minnesota, the great Minnesota get together. Okay. That's what they call the State Fair. Um, and everybody goes. Like, it is, it's rated like one of the top state fairs in the country. Mm. I think they held it this year. I'm not sure. Um, but that's what everybody does. And so it was, that's what we wanted. Like, all walks of life, all socioeconomic walks of life. Doesn't matter who you are. I, you know, we saw like, oh shoot, I forget his name. Anyway, but you would see celebrity Minnesota celebrities there, um, and so that's what we wanted. That, and this was actually something we talked about very initially when we were talking about design for the page. It's like, what if? we sort of replicate that state fair feel and we make each genre on the web page a booth that you can step into oh. and sort of experience it in that way like as a community of people who are interested in this particular sideshow or people mm -hmm. who are interested in this sideshow and technically it would cause more problems than um i think we because you know we're still our our web page was still an HTML web page right and so our designer, our our, our web guru, um, kind of talked us down from that because it was a whole bunch of extra work for her, um, and it was probably a smart choice. But now like all the, the websites like there's you can do things like that now. It's all embedded mm. in the sort of pre-made websites. But that was, that was a consideration of ours. It's like how do you create that feel like are where people watching is okay where you know, everyone is there sort of under the same pretense and it's it's the broadest mix of ideas and personalities that you could imagine in a single space. And like, mm -hmm. so that that's what we mean by, by space, um, by setting. Like, can we recreate that with a journal? Can we recreate that with individual pieces, but then also the pieces collectively, do they do they continue to speak to that? So that actually speaks to one of our, our processes as editors. Um, we try to be as hands off as we can until we start putting the journal itself together. Like um, every once in a while, I, I do say, hey, <laughs> you know, this person sent some work, we should take it very seriously. Uh, but we try to stay out of each other's way in that initial process because we don't, and, and a lot of journals you know, they like, oh, this journal is this theme and this journal is this theme. It's like, we want that to sort of form organically. Like, how do the pieces begin to speak to each other? Um, and it was something that I sort of noticed when I was editor at Waterstone to you as, as a grad student. It's like, we didn't set in with a specific theme in mind, but themes arose. Like, mm -hmm. you, you sort of, again, sort of speaking to um, that organic kind of, uh, um, sort of unconscious cohesion that happens in any space if you spend enough time there um you know, we start seeing the same things or start liking the same things or things that sort of work really well together um and it, 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 the, the idea is to let it grow organically and not have a heavy hand in sort of pushing pieces or rejecting pieces because well we decided this one's about abandoned kitties and this piece is great but it doesn't talk about abandoned kitties so we're not gonna mm -hmm. we're not gonna publish it um mm -hmm. Uh, our, our 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 distinctions for not taking pieces are, are, are slightly different because you know we're looking for work that 
uh, is very conscious about language first more than anything else. Um, so we might get great stories that have really traditional narrative arcs that are you know, great character development, great plot development, doing all these great things as a traditional kind of story with a very traditional kind of voice. Um, but it's not really, that's not really what we want to do. We want something that sort of moves away from that, where it pushes language to the forefront of what's important about how, how the piece functions. Um, and I, I, I like to tell this story... Um, so I'm going to tell it again. Uh, one of my favorite pieces to select, and this is sort of early, 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 early on in, in the journal, might have been the second second or third year, and I got this piece that I almost gave up on. Um, in fact, I told the author, like, don't, we don't want the first page, we start at page two, we'll take this. But it took me forever to, like, sort of figure out I even wanted it. The title is called An Inconclusive Visit Amongst Strangers. Hmm. And so it, in, it's broken up into three sections, like very much like uh, Sound and the Fury. But the whole thing, it's like waiting for Godot or, you know, like nothing happens, <laughs> right? And so these three strangers are waiting around for something and nothing, absolutely, absolutely nothing happens in the story. But that's what the title tells you up front, right? It's an inconclusive visit among strangers. I'm like, oh my God, that, that's great. <laughs> and the, but language, that's the thing that kept me reading was the language. It's like, mm. okay, nothing's happening, but this language is like pushing pushing the story in a really, really interesting way. So it's like, okay, I have to have this piece, but I, it's like the first page has got to go. And of course the author was, it was kind enough, but the, you know, that's, if we can find work that, that does that, you know, mm -hmm. that that's of interest to us. Mm -hmm. sure. How much editorial work are you willing to take on with an author? Uh, quite a bit, actually. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm all, always nervous when I hit send and then like I'm sending a piece that has like tons of marks on it. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause you know, I've, I've had authors get upset. Um, I had one author, I told them, this is again, this is very early on and it happens less, less frequently. Um, it hasn't happened in a while, but I, very early on, there was an author. You sent the piece in second person. I was like, "This isn't a, I, you know, this isn't work in second person. It has to be third person." And the author just flat out refused to make any of the edits. And I was oh, like, wow. "I, I think we're done." <laughs> 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 um, and so that piece did not go up. Um, yeah. But yeah, I there you know there's there's always those gems where you know there's one minor thing that you have mm -hmm. to address or you know those rare 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 unicorns where you don't have to change anything mm -hmm. um but you know we we have a team uh, especially with fiction you know we have a team where we're each looking at the pieces and we're each like reviewing each other's work um and i always I always have the final say as, as head fiction editor like I want to look at everybody's edits before we send these things back to the authors but they, we we have a fairly heavy hand and and like what's on the page well mm -hmm. we i've i've asked authors to cut uh, like there was this great piece i'm drawing a blank on the on the name but it, he sent it it was originally like 28 pages um and i i thought it was great but i also thought it moved a little slow and like there were sections that even though they were interesting sort of historically they weren't they weren't they were interfering with the tension. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, can you can you trim it down about eight pages? Mm -hmm. And I showed him where I think that would work. And we compromised. And he, he cut a significant amount, but he mm -hmm. kept some of the stuff that I thought he should trim. But it, the piece still works. And it's like, but yeah, I, you know, I, I, again, it's, it's always it's always you know, a tricky, like, you know, some people don't want to make any edits. But right. um, but if you, if you if you're making the right edits, if you're showing them, yeah, the piece is stronger if you do this. Uh -huh. um then they're, they're usually quite compliant so yeah and it seems like that's something you enjoy doing too oh yeah there, oh yeah absolutely writer. if absolutely. they're willing to make the changes and that's sort yeah. of a pleasurable because i know a lot of editors just won't they don't have time they're procedure yeah. submissions they just can't but it sounds like that's something that's part of the editorial work that you enjoy yeah yeah and i and i take the title editor literally right yeah. I'm, I'm, an editor. I'm not just a publisher i'm an editor too so right. it's like uh, you know, that's kind of my job to, to mm -hmm. say the piece functions, yeah, the piece functions if you make these changes just a little bit stronger. And yeah. I don't know how many times I've said you cut the last line and end the line before the last line because that's really where the story ends. And yeah. So how did you, it sounds like your background is in poetry and you're, you're a poet, um, but oh. now you're the fiction editor for the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you're cutting everything. To <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, um, yeah. My, my my actual training is in poetry, but you know, I write fiction too. I write a lot of short fiction, um, okay. mostly flash. Mm -hmm. um, and the so when we were deciding who got what role, mm -hmm. um, we had so our original genres were actually drama, uh, nonfiction, poetry, and fiction, and then we had the ephemera section. The ephemera section's always been there. And we, again, we'll circle back to the ephemera section and talk a little bit more about that because it, it's, it's fun. I, yeah. I love doing work for that. Um, and, uh, Becky Weaver, who was our original poetry editor, um, and it's like, well, I write fiction too. And, you know, I'd taken fiction classes. I wasn't sure actually when I got to Hamlin if I was going to do fiction or, or poetry. Um, and, you know, the, I, I was 99% sure by the by the end of the first year that it was poetry, but I wasn't, I wasn't sure that first year, um, midway through. So it's like, yeah, I can, I'll, I'll do fiction. And, um, and you know, I, I read a lot of fiction. So it's not like I'm one of those poets who doesn't read fiction or something like that. You know, that I know plenty of people who are like that. Um, the, but you know, fiction is, is, um, like, if, if I had time to write more of it, I would definitely write more of it. And I was, I was talking with, uh, I don't know if you know, Kevin McClellan, uh, we, uh, we're in a writing group together and we, we always talk about like what we're doing and what, what the process is. And so strangely enough for me, when I'm in the middle of like a, like putting a manuscript together and I'm not just sort of like writing poems, um, I can't write other poems. I, I have to work on fiction. Cause if I like work on other poems, it sort of interferes with the process and, right. It's, yeah, because like the last book, I had a, a notion about what the book was going to be about or what, how it was going to function. And the one I'm working on right now is similar to, um, but I just, I can't do poetry while I'm I'm doing these other poems. And so I turn to fiction and I'll either revise something I've already been working on or I'll start something new. And it helps that it's flash too. Mm -hmm. um, that like most of the stuff I do is flash. Some pieces get extended. Like I just wrote one that is about 11 pages. Um, but most of it is like a less than a thousand words because it sort of keeps me close to the the form of fiction in a way, but it gives me also a chance to step away from it and do something creative that isn't going to interfere with how I'm thinking about the, the book that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. um, so do you see a lot of submissions that are not right for oh, my the journal? I, I imagine, I mean, all editors do, <clears throat> but it, because yeah. you're... Um, focus is so specific and your um, kind of style, what you're looking for is so specific. Yeah. If, uh, I'm wondering if that's like one of your biggest frustrations as an editor. Like this is a great piece, but this is not at all what we <laughs> publish. Uh, I wouldn't call it a frustration, but it, it does, you know, it is an indication that maybe the person didn't actually read the journal, mm -hmm. um, which is okay. And um, oddly enough, some of, the, some of those pieces end up in the maybe pile. Like we, okay. you know, we're not... We're not like the Paris Review. We don't get hundreds of thousands of, of submissions, but um, you know, we we publish probably when all is said and done, a little bit less than four percent, I think. Okay. So, yeah. So I only publish sixteen pieces of fiction a year. Like we publish four per per issue, and just to sort of give you an idea then like the sort of fluidity of the journal like the the poets don't have a certain number that they publish and the nonfiction editor doesn't have a specific number like it could be one it could be two uh the poets could be like eight could be six could be ten um so we're the only genre where like it's four every time <laughs> um but i've broken from that too I've, I've broken from it um but so you know i've got we've got a lot of fiction to to read and um again if it's good but it doesn't quite feel like what we were looking for mm -hmm. that, uh, essentially it'll end up in the ma in the maybe pile because we won't ditch it right away mm -hmm. it's like well what if we don't get four pieces that sort of do the thing that we really want to do and that's happened before so mm -hmm. you know we, we we stay open like we're we're right. not gonna if we like it we're not gonna um say no to it until we know it's not gonna fit at all and we'll even choose pieces for like issues out so like we may be working on the, the July issue, but we'll hold on to this. Maybe it'll fit in the next issue, right? So yeah. we, we sort of keep, try to keep it as, as fluid as possible when we're uh, thinking about what, what goes in each issue. That's interesting. So have you ever had the experience where this is, you know what you're aiming to do as a journal and you know what your vision mm -hmm. is, but mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of the particular batch of submissions you've gotten, we can't, <laughs> you can't yeah. quite 
publish mm -hmm. the work that lines mm -hmm. up with that vision perfectly. And but that's also in in keeping with the sort of the mission of the journal. Like right. if you really are that great get together, like I don't wanna say no arbitrarily because I in my mind have an idea about what right. fits in our aesthetic. So mm -hmm. I just try to stay try to stay open as, mm -hmm. as much as I can. And you know it changed it, it evolves over the years like when we first started doing this i think the average page for short stories was closer to 20 but because it's you know the internet shrinks our attention span like the average read on on the, for a publication is between five and ten pages now mm -hmm. um but we still publish like longer pieces we've published three novellas like sequentially mm -hmm. um so again we, you know trying to stay true to that initial mission, like we're the great get together, this meeting grounds of a wide range of voices and styles. Yeah. We try to stay true to that. But yeah, we definitely are looking for something initially. Um, and, you know, I think um, it's kind of one of those things like we don't know it until we see it. Right? Yeah. Because we don't want to, again, it's like, I don't want to publish the exact same kind of thing over and over and over and over again. I don't want to be that journal. Um, so we just, it, if, if it, if it really speaks to us, we're, we're open to it. Like mm -hmm. we don't want to, we don't want to say no to something that, that we think works really, really well. Can you talk about a piece, maybe in your most recent issue or more recently that you felt you got it and you were like, yes, this is <laughs> why we created this journal. This is what we're about. Yeah. Um, so a piece that I fell in love with on the first read, like before I even got through the first stanza was Drive By by Meg Tewitt. Okay. In fact, we just nominated it for a Best of the Net Award. Oh, cool. um, and, you know, I'm familiar with Meg. We've published Meg, I think this might be our fourth time now in the in the 15 years. Um, you know, we, we have we have authors who sort of return to us, right? They, they, they know that we like their work, and um, so they return to us. Um, and it's funny because, like, I'll forget sometimes. Um, this just happened with another author that we accepted a work and I, I knew we had accepted work from this author before. And then like, you know, cause you can put their name in the search window and see where mm -hmm. their submissions are and submittable. And then I realized, oh, wow, they've submitted every year for the, like the last eight years. And I only remember these two that we took. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so there's definitely, there, there's definitely like a stable of authors who really like, what yeah. we're doing, they get what we're doing, they they work in that way, they, their work speaks to us, um, and you know, they keep returning and we keep accepting the work. Um, then we get people who are sort of new to what we're doing and um, and it's just, we find these, these great pieces that mm -hmm. from authors we're not even familiar with. Um, but like Drive By was just, it was, it was so good. Um, and I, I was familiar with Meg's work already and so I, I kind of knew what to expect going in, but, but I haven't I haven't taken everything that she's submitted to us, right? And so, um, but this one was just I, I knew immediately it's like oh wow this this is really doing a lot in such a short space because mm -hmm. I don't even think it's six hundred words. It just it's mm -hmm. short, but it's so dense. Um, it's one of those pieces like you you could publish it as a poem. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the language works in that mm -hmm. way. It would be a complicated poem, but it, I mean, if you really, really, really wanted to, you could. Yeah. Um, so that that was what initially drew me in. Um, but then the story is compelling, and mm -hmm. just the fact that she, it it gets so so much done in such a short amount of time, just yeah, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So and it then, sounds like writers should keep submitting. Um, do you have any rule like wait six months or wait a year? Um, we don't. We don't. Um, there is, there is in the submission saying like, if you don't submit more than once during any submission period, mm -hmm. um, if like, if we've already like rejected you, <laughs> um, um, but our submission period is from January to, to the end of May. Okay. And then we have, we haven't made it public, but in the last couple of years, we've, we've left the tip jar submission options open. Mm -hmm during the summertime, during uh, sort of the off uh, submission period. Um, so I guess I just made a public announcement about it. <laughs> um, but the, the real, only reason we weren't like, public, like publicizing that is just we were like, we don't want to like create too much work, additional work for ourselves. Right. So we wanted to see just how much work it brought in. It's been, it's been great actually. Um, but like, so if authors wanted to like submit during that time period, again, 
perfectly welcome to do that. Yeah. Wait, um, sorry. So the, the regular submissions is January to May, but then there are yeah. tip jar submissions outside that period? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Tip jar submissions open all year round. I see. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, we've, that was also one of our initial uh, mm -hmm. goals was to stay free. It was like the internet should be free, right? It should yeah. be it should be something that everybody has access to. There shouldn't be restrictions on it. We should all have access to the same amount of information and like the same user abilities. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we had we had to we had to add some monetization, right? Uh, because you know, submittable is not free, and running a website is not free, and so there, there we had to do some things. And we we put there's language about that in the. Mm -hmm. In the submission policies and guidelines on the web page about like if you want if you want to support us and help us keep keep printing great work mm -hmm. then you know use this option um but we do have free options and we'll, we'll always have a free option for That's people to, and you also have that. yearly contests as well oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah and that that's <laughs> been fun too like yeah. i i we just ran i think it was the fifth year running of the 1000 below Flash Pros and Poetry Contest. Um, okay. Yeah, and that that was, um, again, sort of a brainstorm out of a, a session. We had run an, a contest prior to that called Monstrosities of the Midway. Mm -hmm. um, and that first year we ran it, it was fantastic. It was great. Um, the second year we ran it, we were just excited about the pieces that we got. We it sort of felt like people were like, taking monstrosities just a little bit too literally, like that first year, you know, it was like a, a monstrosity can be anything, you'd be like, the, like the worst date you, you ever yeah. went on with something like the, you know what be be liberal with that that right. term um and then it just it wasn't it wasn't we weren't getting the kind of results that we wanted so mm -hmm. we sort of abandoned that but we, we knew we wanted a to run a, a contest and we wanted to have some an iconic kind of feel to it and so we we had a brainstorming session about what to call it you know how to promote it um you know what kind of judges we were looking for mm -hmm. uh, and so we landed on flash um and so we we, we you know but let's keep it open to all you know because mm -hmm. usually that was the new thing too like people are like flash fiction but like what's what if we did flash nonfiction? what if we did flash poetry and then we had to invent what flash poetry meant <laughs> um like what was the word li limit on a flash <laughs> poem because you can get a lot said in a poem you know, right you any k ryan like she does miracles in about 60 words um so we uh, we said 40, like, can we get really engaging, interesting poetry mm -hmm. in 40 words or less? And if you leave the form open, like we get some really amazing, really, mm -hmm. really imaginative poetry. In fact, I, did, I don't want to say too much about the finalists, but we had some, some amazing, <laughs> we had some amazing poetry this year. That's great. Oh, so the contest is open now and you're- it, No, to... no, we're waiting to hear back from our judge. We've, oh, what, right, we've okay. We've selected the finalists and we've sent them on to the judge and we're waiting mm -hmm. to hear back. Okay, yeah. and then when is the next contest running? Uh, it starts March first. Okay. It runs, yeah, we collect submissions for the contest from March to May, so March, okay. April, May. Okay. Yeah. And how do you promote the work once it's published? I know that's like oh, yeah. a million dollar question for all editors. Like, <laughs> how do you actually grow your readership? <laughs> yeah. Do you, uh, I know you guys are on Twitter, but like. Yeah. What, uh, yeah, what, how do you get what, it? What out? aren't we on? Um, <laughs> uh, so we have a LinkedIn page, we have okay. a Facebook page, we have an Instagram page, we have a Twitter page. Uh, that might be it. Um, but yeah, so we do a lot of promo stuff on a Twitter, which, you know, Twitter, like as an individual, uh, didn't, didn't do much for me, but mm -hmm. I, I, you know, as an editor, we realized how, how useful Twitter can be as a tool. Um, so, um, funny story. <laughs> um, so, if you look at our Twitter page, um, you know the handle is at Penel Ralph because mm -hmm. um, it used to be at Midway Journal. But um, I thought I, I was going to get this was during during the pandemic. I was like, I had I guess I had too much time on my hands or something. I was like, oh, I'm going to be clever. I'm going to make our birthday the day the first issue of Midway, and of course. Um, that made us younger than 14 years right. old <laughs> and they shut down the account. Oh, no. <laughs> I was like, okay, we've been with you since 2011. So I, yeah. I e emailed them kind of an angry email. I was like, we've been with you since 2011. Um, and I am clearly not 
younger than 14 right. and, <laughs> like, I sent a picture of my ID is like you know this is who I am yeah they didn't open it they didn't even get back to me they didn't open it back up so I had to restart it um and then it, I was like you know let's let's just hit a, a bunch of people that we already know but let's let's go in a different direction let's see if we can get new uh authors to submit and it actually was a blessing in disguise huh. um because yeah instead of just sort of recontacting everybody who sort of following us before we mm. contact people who are brand new to us mm. and we got some great submissions one and one of the authors um who just sort of came out of nowhere uh her, her name is lucy Zhang. she um she does a lot of these uh uh digital works like digital mm -hmm. fiction um so uh, she, she must have some like coding ex experience mm -hmm. but um where she sent us these pieces that moved and like they evolved and shared more text as they evolved as you interacted wow. with more and so we took several of those but you know we only, we only found her because of this thing that happened and right it's all the thing yeah yeah it wasn't in disguise yeah but yeah, we do. We try to do a lot of promotion, mm -hmm. individual authors, um, and we promote each issue when it comes out, and we promote winners. We do. Uh, we nominate authors for every award that we can physically nominate them for. Mm -hmm. um, we just sent out our our uh, nominees for Best in the Net. Push cards coming up um, starts in October. And then there's Best Small Fiction, and yeah, there's. Whatever, whatever way we can promote our authors mm -hmm. is what we're going to do it. Yeah. So we, we yeah. promote on all social media platforms that we have accounts with for That's sure. Right. Yeah. And do you feel the readership is growing? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, it evolves. We, we, I mm -hmm. always recognize like the names who mm -hmm. people who routinely send to us, but then every year there's names I, I don't recognize. And, um, you know, it, it just, it's growing. Like we, we broke, and I think it had everything to do with the, the pandemic, um, just because people, again, they were at home more and they had more time online. Um, but in 2020, we, we actually set a record for number of submissions that oh, we got great. during our open submission period, um, you know, not including the, the extra ones. But mm -hmm. we almost got as many this year, too, which I, I thought was great. I thought, oh, you know, people are going back to work. They aren't mm -hmm. as home as much. Um, but it really didn't change mm -hmm. how many we got. Yeah. So I'm hoping that's a that's a trend that continues to. Yeah. And now that we're because we didn't used to be on Instagram, we didn't used to be on um, LinkedIn, but like mm -hmm. it's like, well, let's reach everybody as much as we can. And is LinkedIn a valuable resource for literary journals? I, I there have are a lot LinkedIn. of writers. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a bunch of journals on LinkedIn. Oh, and okay. we, you know, we have we have like three thousand followers on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. If, no one ever has ever said, um, "I found your journal on LinkedIn." <laughs> <laughs> I always think of it as I don't know, so like more corporate job mm -hmm. applying mm -hmm. resume. But maybe there's the literary scene there too. I, I should yeah, I, I actually so I did solicit people who work through LinkedIn because oh. I they they listed themselves as right, and that's what it, that's like if I'm looking to increase their followers, like get just new faces, new names, right. like, you know, I'm looking for what they're promoting themselves as author mm -hmm. fiction like that. And so, you know, I found some, I went to their, their, their web pages were listed on their LinkedIn page. So I went there, checked out their work. Mm -hmm. um, really great. Um, some really great finds through LinkedIn. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, so one of my questions actually is about editor burnout. Um, but it doesn't <laughs> seem <laughs> you you seem like you're really um, enjoying the work. You don't you don't seem burned out because <laughs> yeah. I know you you teach full time at a university, right? And then you're also teaching. Is this night classes at the Cambridge Center? For yeah, 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 yeah. Just um, just <laughs> <laughs> okay. One <laughs> night class and poetry, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know personal life, family, all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So how what well, my question to editors is always what keeps you coming back to the work, but it, it really, see, I mean, you're, you're sort of exuding enthusiasm for it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a labor of love. It absolutely yeah, is. Yeah. Um, and you know, there, you know, I don't, maybe not to be too forthright, but there's definitely been times where I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I yeah. just don't have the time. Like, <laughs> or maybe I can just let something else go. I'm like, what, what, what's the balance? Um, and you know, sleep, I can, I can fudge on sleep. Um, but it's, it's great. And, you know, and, yeah. and, um, and still in touch, you know, with the, the original founding editors are still like contributing editors and, mm -hmm. um, I've met some great 
people through just like authors. Okay, so I don't know if you know Alina Stefanescu, mm -hmm. the author. Fantastic fiction writer. She also writes okay. poetry. Um, and she's been sort of winning a bunch of awards recently. Mm -hmm. uh, but I met her through Midway because she submitted to the contest and I thought for sure her piece was going to win. Like I thought, oh, this is a no-brainer. And then she didn't. She didn't even place. She didn't get first, second, or third. Wow. I was like, well, that that just blew me away. That, I just want to pause quickly because I think that's such a great lesson for writers that are listening. Like just because you don't win a contest or you don't get first, second, or third place, it doesn't mean that somebody out there isn't recognizing how great the work is. So yeah. it, that, that's really great to hear that sometimes um, it just you know connects with the guest editor or doesn't connect mm -hmm. for whatever subjective reason, but yeah. it can still be great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I contacted her. I was like, we, can we still have your piece? I know it didn't win. And I explained to her, like, I really thought it was going to win. Um, and she said, yeah. And so I published it. And um, and then I ended up doing a review of her work because I like the work so much. And her mm -hmm. book had just come out. So I wrote a review of her book. And she's been a return author. She sent us numerous pieces. She won. Um, she got into the Best Small Fiction, the piece that she published with us last oh, year. Got the Best Small Fiction Anthology. Uh, I've met her in person, you know, we've hung out, I had, I let her, um, I invited her, I shouldn't say I let her, I invited her <laughs> to um, do a book signing at the Midway Table in, oh, cool. in Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, God, that's so long ago now. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it just, it, it grew into this great friendship. And mm -hmm. um, I know several, several of our authors that way now too. Yeah, mm -hmm. Because one thing I decided to do also was I started up a, a reading series in New York at the oh. AGB bar because we, we seem to publish a, a lot of New York authors. And, mm. I, and, and that's also something I should talk about, like in the formation of the journal too. And I'll, and I'll swing back to that in a second. Um, so we started this, this reading series because I noticed uh, so many of our, not just in fiction, but in poetry and nonfiction, so many of our authors were actually, that we were publishing, I shouldn't say that we're, that we're getting submissions from, but the ones that we ended up publishing seemed to be from New York area. So it was like, let's just, start a reading series that honors those those voices since mm. there's so many of them um so i've met uh, so many of the authors in person because of this reading series mm -hmm. and it's just you know just great to sort of know them in addition to knowing their work right and yeah. so I wouldn't have this opportunity if i weren't uh, doing this thing right um and it, that that it sort of again sort of falls in line with how we should promote ourselves like the great minnesota get together like <laughs> yeah come come be part of the family uh -huh. Um, but so circle back to the, the thing that I was going to say about the, the, the shocked us about it. when we first, first started that very first issue, we, we had no idea. Like we hit send, <laughs> well, we didn't hit send, but the, our, our tech person like made it live and we were like, what, what, we had no idea what to expect. And we realized in our very first issue that we had an international readership, hmm. like, because you can check your analytics through the website. Mm -hmm. We had readers and people from Germany, England, J Japan, like all these people from other countries. We were not counting on that. Like all of a sudden we were an international journal. Mm -hmm. right? And we've published authors from Germany. We've published authors. And in those first few years, back in like 2007, 2008, totally unexpected consequence. But we realized because of who we were, what we we're doing, how we were doing it, we had spoken to a bunch of people in a very, very particular way. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was a great experience and so feeds, one of the things that we tried to keep from doing and, and mentioned this a couple times, like how, how you don't want to like make the, the definition too narrow or yeah. you just close the doors to all the different voices you might expose yourself to for sure. Um, so is there a way for people to get more involved with the journey? It sounds like the writers are already very involved there are yeah, readings yeah. and um, there's a connection with you and with the other editors um, but are you ever looking for additional readers or different uh, yeah 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 um we 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 have internships we we post with a couple different institutions mm -hmm. um we've had interns work with us from uh, uh mcallister college from the university of minnesota from san diego state from there's, um, we have an intern right now who's actually, we've, I, we've never done this before, but she's actually, um, a high school student mm -hmm. who she's at an arts high school 
and so she's like interested in journalism and writing. She's gonna, she's uh, intending to go to Yale, all this kind of stuff. But she's, you know, she's been fantastic. She had done internships with Loft Literary Center in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. uh, a couple other organizations that I, uh, you know really really respect from that area and so it's like okay well you know this is the first time <laughs> that we've, we've actually worked with someone um but she's been, you know she's been great uh but we, we sometimes have more than one intern mm -hmm. during the course of a of a year because like oh i'm looking for an internship for the summer or i'm looking for an internship over the, the course of the academic year so sometimes we'll just have one but sometimes we'll have multiple um and the if if you've done if anyone in the audience had done any sort of work with um like readership with any kind of journal um there's there's still a lot of turnover for readers um you know because readership's an unpaid position uh so people give what they can and that talk about burnout right <laughs> there's usually a little bit of burnout for readers so that's kind of a revolving door i think right now we're set for readers but that's always it doesn't mean don't ask mm -hmm. um and um so yeah that it, it that's because who knows? Who knows? We right. might someone might say, "Hey, I have to step away, and you know, I've got to focus on something else mm -hmm. right now." And it's like, yeah, you get it, and you can't you can't demand that they stay. Right. <laughs> yeah. So if people are interested, should they just send oh yeah, through the site? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even if we can't find readerships for them, you know, they, they can help in other ways. Okay. Um, you know, they could be they could uh, like help at they could sort of work as a um someone who helps us with on-site events once mm -hmm. we start doing on-site events again, right things like that right. it's going to be like a liaison and we actually had somebody on the ground for us in new york to sort of help us as a liaison to, oh, cool. to maneuver that space while we weren't physically there yeah right right mm -hmm. this is great ralph thank yeah, you so right, much right. this is so Absolutely. informative um do you have any final words of advice to people who uh your submissions period is open now so people watching might be getting ready to submit any um, well, the, official, <laughs> the official submissions period opens in january Janu right sorry yeah. I thought we, I the, tip jar submissions, yeah. the tip, tip jar submissions are open all year round okay um but yeah you know spend some time with the journal our next issue is going to be fantastic we're going to publish the winners from the contest mm -hmm. um we'll publish all the other uh other authors that we have uh set up for this issue but it's gonna be great mm -hmm. um and just you know look at that issue look at some of the back issues you can look at our back issues we don't we we all those are free we don't put a subscriber fee on that as well sort of staying with that mm -hmm. initial impulse to keep everything free on the internet if we can um and you know even if you don't think your work fits you know, that doesn't mean it doesn't fit right and so <laughs> um we we may have a future conversation about your poem we want to publish it as a piece of nonfiction, right so just keep in mind that we we're open to we want good work and we're open to work that that pushes boundaries and pushes complicates uh narratives um yeah so I just if you think you see something of the of your work in what we've done, then we're probably interested in what you're doing for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. It was great. It's good to see you.